Do you want to get your Section 230 immunity revoked? Because this is how you get your Section 230 immunity revoked. Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber. I do these things called vlogs. Where is it? Here. You know what they are. If you don't know what they are, go back and watch a ton of videos. It'll also help my channel grow. All right, Twitter has announced that it is doing something that can only be described as either poking the bear or the boiling frog. And for those of you who don't know what those analogies mean, poking the bear means you keep doing something to irritate a very powerful creature so that it finally unleashes its powers on you. And the boiling frog metaphor is when you put a frog in cold water but slowly start boiling the temperature, the frog doesn't recognize that the temperature is getting hotter because it is a cold-blooded animal and heats up with the water. So the water always feels like the same temperature to the frog until such time that it is actually boiling, cooks the frog for a delicious French dinner. Twitter has announced that it is going to start censoring or flagging or giving warnings to tweets coming from official public officials, like members of government, if those tweets are deemed to be violating the terms of service of Twitter, whatever those terms of service are. And at first I thought it had to be fake news because it is impossible that a platform of the size and importance of Twitter could possibly discuss censoring government officials in their tweeting business, regardless of whether or not they agree with the tweets or find them offensive or whatever. But no, they're actually doing it and I had to go read from the blog post of Twitter in order to get the details and let me read that blog post to you very quickly. Thursday, 27 June 2019. Our highest priority is to protect the health of the public conversation on Twitter, and an important part of this is ensuring our rules and how we enforce them are easy to understand. No comment. In the past, we've allowed certain tweets that violated our rules to remain on Twitter because they were in the public's interest. But it wasn't clear when and how we made those determinations. Are we discussing a platform as in a town square model right now, or are we discussing the editorial room in the New York Times or the Huffington Post? To fix that, we're introducing a new notice that will provide additional clarity in these situations and sharing more on when and why we'll use it. Serving the public conversation includes providing the ability for anyone to talk about what matters to them. This can be especially important when engaging with government officials and political figures. Let's just let that sink in. They are talking about letting people talk about what matters to them while also discussing how to censor that and provide warnings when they don't agree with what the person is talking about. And this whole discussion fits perfectly into the vlog I did a little while ago on whether or not Facebook and YouTube are publishers or platforms. Whether or not they benefit from or should lose the immunity that was provided to them under Section 230 of the CDA, the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act reads as follows. No provider or user of an interactive computer computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. This provision of the CDA was specifically added in 1996 to respond to certain concerns that platforms on the newly developed and ever-expanding internet would be held liable for the content uploaded by their users and as such it would kill the growth of the internet. It would kill the entire industry if platforms and service providers were held liable for all of the illegal and wrongful acts of their users. And to understand the context of Section 230, we have to go back to 1991 to a CompuServe decision. CompuServe CompuServe was the first major online service provider in the United States. In 1991, CompuServe was sued for defamation by Cubby because apparently some defamatory content was posted online on CompuServe's platform. CompuServe's defense was that they did not and could not know that that defamatory content was on their platform because they didn't do any moderating or verification of the user-generated content that was uploaded to their platform. And they were subsequently not held liable for the defamatory content because they were deemed to have not known or could not have known that that defamatory content was on their platform. Fast forward to 1995 and you have the Stratton versus Prodigy lawsuit. And that's virtually the same as CompuServe with one major difference. In the Prodigy lawsuit, you have the plaintiff Stratton Oakmont suing Prodigy and a uh, user on Prodigy's platform who uploaded defamatory content to the platform. The defamatory content alleged that Stratton Oakmont and its principals engaged in criminal activity before an initial public offering. The details don't really matter. The bottom line is that the lawsuit was virtually identical to the CompuServe lawsuit with one major difference. Prodigy moderated the content that was uploaded onto its platform and in so doing the court came to the conclusion that they exercised editorial control over the content that was on their platform and as such were held liable for the defamatory nature of the content uploaded to that platform. And it was in this context that Section 230 of the CDA was implemented so that internet service providers who did attempt to ensure that there was no illegal or defamatory content uploaded to their platforms would not be held liable as a result of actually engaging in moderation. And you could sort of see the concern that Section 230 was responding to. In Prodigy, you had the platform being held liable because it did in fact make an attempt to moderate, whereas in CompuServe, the company was not held liable because it didn't attempt to moderate. And so we were sort of faced with a paradoxical situation where a 
company that was in fact moderating the content that was uploaded to its platform was held to a higher standard than a company that did no moderation whatsoever. And Section 230 was implemented so that internet service providers and platforms could attempt to moderate illegal and defamatory content without running the risk of themselves being held liable for that defamatory content. And so you're going to have some people saying that Section 230 was specifically implemented so that platforms could in fact moderate without being held liable. And then you're going to have others saying, well, there's a world of difference between moderating illegal and defamatory content and removing it when a platform becomes aware of it versus exercising what is effectively purely editorial discretion as to what content is uploaded and or removed and or flagged on a platform. Section 230 creates immunity for internet service providers by creating a presumption that they will not be treated as publishers for the content uploaded to their platforms by their users. But they can in fact lose that immunity and effectively become publishers by exercising a sufficient degree of editorial control and curating the content that is uploaded or removed from that platform. And it's happened. In the decision of MCW versus BadBusinessBureau.com, the immunity was rejected on the basis that the defendant in fact engaged in writing disparaging editorials about the plaintiff, such that they became information content providers and therefore lost their immunity protection under Section 230 of the CDA. So there is in fact case law that the immunity provided for under Section 230 of the CDA can in fact be revoked, such that the platform can in fact be held liable for all the damages that a publisher can be held liable for. And what is Twitter proposing to do right now? It's going to be a question of opinion as to whether or not Twitter is acting as a platform or as an editorial board. But let's just go read Twitter's own words on how they are going to implement this particular type of notice. How will we decide when to use this notice? A cross-functional team including trust and safety, legal, public policy, and regional teams will determine if the tweets are a matter of public interest based on the criteria listed above and the following considerations. But what seems to be abundantly clear on its face is that they are exercising a great amount of discretion and editorial control as to when this notice gets implemented. Purely subjective editorial discretion. And let's just play some thought experiments as to what can possibly go wrong with this. First of all, some people might consider this to be defamatory. To have one of your tweets qualify is sufficiently offensive or controversial that it needs Twitter's intervention to authorize and warn people that there might be something terrible in the tweet they're about to see. And it's not like accidents don't happen. It's not like videos don't get randomly and wrongly flagged as containing hate speech and then get demonetized and sometimes even removed from a platform. That never happens. Mistakes happen. Wrongly characterizing someone's tweet as offensive or controversial such that it requires a warning in Twitter's intervention can be deemed to be defamatory. And along the same lines as mistakes happen, imagine imposing whatever procedure is going to be imposed on a tweet and it accidentally flags a tweet that was in fact not offensive such that someone does not get that tweet or does not get it in time. Let's just say that a public official comes out with a tweet that says that there is a savage storm that is going to ravage South Dakota and for whatever the reason, maybe because Twitter sees the words ravage, savage, and south, decides to flag this tweet and make it more difficult for people to access and as a result of people not accessing that tweet in time, people get injured or die as a result of a savage storm that ravages South Dakota. What's Twitter going to argue now? That they benefit from section 230 immunity because they're just a platform and not a public Publisher? That it's not as a direct result of their editorial discretionary curating of content that someone did not get a tweet in time from a public official intended for public consumption because Twitter made a mistake? Because Twitter made a mistake? Alright, and before anyone accuses me of exaggeration, we actually have to see- Yep. What does it say on some of my videos? Comments are disabled. Comments are disabled on some of your videos? Yeah. Oh, I swear to you this was not a setup. <laughs> we'll talk to you about it after. No, Go, wait, get out of here. Wait, what do you mean? Oh, because it, it sort of fits into what we're talking about in oh. this particular video, but I'll explain to you downstairs. Go. Okay. Goodbye! <laughs> Before anyone accuses me of exaggerating, let's read what actually happens to a tweet when it gets so notified to Twitter. What happens to the tweet that gets this notice placed on it? When a tweet has this notice placed on it, it will feature less prominently on Twitter and not appear in safe search, timeline when switched to top tweets, live event pages, recommended tweet push notifications, notifications tab, explore. And this is not hyperbole, it is not exaggeration. It is an actual conceivable risk that will necessarily exist as of the time Twitter implements this policy. All right, back to the video. What's Twitter going to argue now? That it's not as a direct result of their editorial discretionary curating of content that someone did not get a tweet in time from a public official intended for public consumption because Twitter made a mistake? Because the algorithm got it wrong? Because the algorithm flagged a tweet that it ought not have flagged and made it more difficult for people to get as a result? They're going to make the argument that they can't be held liable because of the immunity provided for under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act? Dude, if you want to play that game, you are playing with fire, you are poking a bear, and that bear is the government. And I don't even know what I'm more scared of. Free reign of the tech giant or government intervention. But one thing is clear, Twitter is poking a bear with this move. Twitter is a company that is effectively now saying it gets to decide when it censors the government. To say that that's putting the carriage in front of the horse would be an understatement. That's putting the carriage perpendicularly in front of the horse 
No, I mean, that makes no sense. That is basically big tech thumbing its nose at the government who has the power to regulate it if they see abuse. And there are First Amendment issues, and then there is censoring the government issues. There is censoring the government issues while also reaping the benefits of the immunity provided to you by that very government. All right, I hope that enlightens you as to what's going on. This is a very interesting subject, definitely to be followed, because there will be fallout from this, either legal or legislative. There will be fallout. This is not going to fly like that in a free democratic society. Society, period full stop and the obligatory if you like this content please be sure to like share subscribe if you like the shirts I'll post some link to some merch this one is not available because it was a Father's Day gift from my wife and the motto is actually know the vlog and not know your vlog but whatever we've got the vlog shirt we've got the vlog dog shirt and when I get the vlog dog shirt ordered because we ordered a few of them I'm gonna put it on but that is it now you know your vlog peace out boom